Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Laura Dinning, an outreach librarian for North Yorkshire Libraries. Before we get started, just to let you know that we'll have an audience Q&A later. So if you have any questions for Simon, please do put them in the chat as we go along and we'll try to get through as many as we can. On that note, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Simon Scarrow. Simon is a Sunday Times best-selling author, well known for his Eagle of the Empire series and a range of other historical fiction. He's here today to talk about his latest book, the second in a new series of crime novels set in Nazi Germany called Dead of Night. Simon, welcome. Hi. You're uh, probably best known for the series of books set in ancient Rome, which I referred to in my introduction. But I know you have written about other periods in history as well. Um, mm -hmm. But with this new series based in Germany at the start of World War II, you've switched to a very different place and time. What was it that inspired you to do this? Um, well, it was as a result of going to the Alderney Literary Festival, which is, um, for my money, the, probably the best literary festival I've ever been to. It's really tiny, um, as you'd expect, being on Alderney, which is three and a half miles long and a mile and a half wide, and about 1,800 people live there. Um, but they managed to get, you know, just a sort of phenomenal range of people in to speak. And whilst I was there, I was taken around and came across this stone pillar out in this patch of grass, um, and they said, do you know what that is? And I said, no. And I said, uh, this, that is the all that remains of the only concentration camp on British soil during the Second World War. And I thought, well, you know, that's really quite interesting. So I did a little bit more digging around, and um, I thought, well, what a brilliant setting. I mean, I hadn't really thought what, what kind of book I would write, but I thought it would be a brilliant setting to do it. And I thought something possibly in a sort of murder mystery thing. And I thought, and then I thought, well, why not the Second World War? You've got um, you know, 6,000 Germans and concentration camp prisoners on this tiny island. And if somebody started bumping them off, the Germans off, for example, they need to bring somebody in to investigate it. And then I discovered that people ended up in Alderney because it was a punishment, you know, because it's, it's where bad soldiers and people who had done something wrong would always uh, be sent. So then I had to ask myself, what would this uh, cop have had to have done to be sent from Berlin to, to Alderney? So then that sort of led to a backtracking to looking at policing in, in Berlin during the Second World War. And then suddenly everything opened up. And I was thinking, my goodness, you know, what a, an astonishing setting uh, to do a sort of a crime series. And, but then, of course, when do you begin it? And then it, it, it seemed quite logical, really, to begin it right at the start of the war um, for a number of reasons. But firstly, there was this massively bad winter, the worst they'd had in, for over 100 years. Um, and that, coupled with the blackout, uh, made suddenly made uh, a sort of a city of light and uh, laughter and all this sort of thing, even though it's Nazi Germany, um, become this sort of playground for criminals, really. So uh, I thought, well, what are, you know, we'll start there. And then that's the idea for this sort of series panned out from there. So there'll be a, a story arc that covers the war. So we can sort of, in the background, there'll be the changing fortunes of Germany, um, against which uh, Horstchenko, the criminal inspector Horstchenko, who's the hero of the series, will be investigating all these crimes. Uh, yeah, it's clear from reading your novels that you meticulously research whatever period you're writing about. Um, can you tell us what research you did for Blackout and Dead of Night and how that informed your writing? Well, I have to say this is this is not one of the uh, more fun things I've had to research. Um, every book I pick up on, on, on Nazi Germany is just such a desperately depressing read. I've uh, recently read a book about this thick on uh, culture in Nazi Germany. And basically, there isn't any, you know, because what they've been doing is they take the film industry, sculpture, poetry, creative writing, art, everything, theatre, music, all of it is dumbed down to this kind of Nazi level of, of uh, acceptability. And then you come across, you know, accounts of what it's like to, you know, to be a Jew, for example, living in Germany during the Second World War, and all the sort of 
horrors that sort of go on there in order to survive. So it's been a pretty difficult thing to research from that point of view. Um, Apart from uh, doing the background reading, uh, the other thing I've done, of course, is go to Berlin a few times just to sort of scout around. And I have to say that having done that, Berlin is now my favourite city anywhere in the world. It's just uh, a phenomenal mixture of um, history, uh, chilled out people, um, and great food, <laughs> if I'm honest. Um, but also, I mean, it's just wandering around Germany. That you get this, you know, around Berlin. You, you get this sense of their approach to history is so different to ours. I mean, you know, in, in Britain, we come, seem to have got ourselves locked into this, let's celebrate our history and, 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 and not think about all the dark side of, of what went on. Whereas in Germany, they do both. They say, yeah, yeah, there are things we're proud of, but equally there are things you know, we're really, really not proud of and we don't want ever to happen again. And we need to make sure that everybody knows this. So this is why they, they trade very much on sort of not... Um, you know, looking at, you know, at, at, at their history is something just to be sort of mindlessly celebrated. It's something to teach them a lesson. And I think that's a very, very healthy attitude and one we should, you know, learn a bit from, I think, in the UK. So um, just going on from that, I know you've, you've got, your background is in teaching, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do you do you write uh, historical fiction to kind of inform people as well as entertain them? Well, I think if, you, if you're learning, you know, if you re are reading historical fiction, you're going to learn. You know, it's just a byproduct of the process. Um, given that that's the case, I, I see no harm in actually making sure that you, you, you know, pack a few lessons in uh, to the fiction. So, yeah, they'll find out more about, you know, uh, what how the police operated in Berlin during the Second World War. They'll learn a lot more about, the, you know, what an insider's view of what surviving under a, a regime led by gangsters is like. Um, although we're getting a pretty good feel for that in the UK these days. Um, so, you know, I was going it, it's, to it's ask you, working. actually, uh, sorry to interrupt, I was, I was going to ask you if you saw any parallels. Um, well, let me think. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's, I mean, it's a bit glib. Um, you know, I, one of the things that, that as a, you know, history student, when I started at university, one of the first things we, did, we were taught was history doesn't repeat itself. You know, it looks like it does occasionally, and there are certain sort of uh, cycles and patterns that do, but it, it's wrong to think that it's the same thing happening over and over again with different faces. I don't think it's as simple as that. Um, that said, you know, you look at the things that are happening, and you look at, for example, how Trump is operating in, in the States, and you look... And it, and you look at things like uh, some of the politics in, in, in Britain, and which is based so transparently on lies, uh, and they, they, you know, they're playing straight out of Joseph Goebbels' copybook. You, know, you, you tell a lie, you repeat it often enough, uh, and you keep it simple, and eventually it becomes the truth. And we're seeing this in, in the way that the, the social media is being played by various people, actually, so that it, you know, the truth isn't now what is true, the truth turns out to be the thing that is circulates with the highest velocity um, and is repeated the most. And that then becomes the truth by default. You know, that's the kind of world we seem to be increasingly li living in. And of course, that is uh, making us highly vulnerable to the kinds of people um, who share a lot of the views and a lot of the uh, uh, politics and practices of the Nazis. I'm not saying they are Nazis, but, you know, it, it's, it's, it's something that should be very concerning to us. Oh, that's, uh, that's fascinating. And I'd love to go more down that pathway, but I think I'll, I'll get back to the book. Um, so you, you mentioned Horst Schenker. So he's the criminal inspector and the central character in Blackout and Dead of Night. Now, he strikes me as a decent man struggling to keep his distance from the party and to also retain his professional and personal values while keeping his job, basically, um, mm. which, of course, is a very tricky balance to maintain. Um, was he an easy character to write? And do you have anything else that you, any other thoughts about the character that you'd like to share? Well, I, I, you know, as I said, the research was pretty grim reading. And of course, one of the things I think I try to pack into both books is, is this kind of awareness of Schenker that he's a moral person, 
serving in an immoral regime. And that means that almost on a daily basis, you're going to have tests, small and large, of your integrity. And what I'm interested in, you know, Schenker is a kind of, a, you know, in, in, a, in a sense, a sort of lab rat. You know, put him in, into this sort of position. How does he respond? And frankly, I don't know. You know, when I write the scene, then I find out how he responds. And, I, and that's the way I've always written about characters, really, is, you know, do a thumbnail sketch. Give, you know, you, you get some sort of basic ideas about how they how they think and what their values are. And then you can test them in various situations. And quite often, you know, I mean, it's one of the big delights of being a, a, a writer is that they will frustrate you sometimes or they'll come respond in a way that you don't anticipate. And when characters start doing that, of course, then that's the point at which I think they feel real. Because I think it was Henry James who made this point about, um, you know, if, if the writer doesn't cry, the reader won't cry. If the writer isn't surprised, the reader won't be surprised. So I think it's important that, um, you, you know, you don't overplan things. You don't over, because otherwise characters just simply become vehicles for whatever hobby horse the, the writer has. You know, if they have uh, created a, a three-dimensional character, then you know the, the character has a bit of integrity, and the character will behave in the way that the character wants to. And when that happens, I think that's that's pure gold, frankly. And he's he's quite conflicted, isn't he, morally, um, Schenker? And yet he sometimes uh, somehow seems to stay on the on the side of the angels, or so far, anyway. Um, and it's difficult to know, isn't it? Have you ever wondered how what you would have been like if you were living in that society as a non-Jewish person? Um, well, I think I would respond like Schenker. I mean, this is this is mm. what you know. I, I, I think all authors put a bit of themselves into their characters, mm. and um, you know, Schenker's outlook on this sort of thing is mine. And, and you know, and I'm not saying that in a, in a sort of oh wow, you know, okay, isn't he a heroic sort of chap that I would like to be? You know, he's a human being, and you know, sometimes he makes difficult mistakes. You know, difficult decisions. Sometimes he makes mis mistakes. We all do. And sometimes he thinks, well, I'd like to respond this way, but frankly, you know, what is the point of it if it gets me killed? You know, um, so if if there's nothing to be gained by getting myself killed, would I do that? So, and I think as the, as the series kinds of pans out, this is going to be increasingly a, you know, a problem for him. How do you survive as, you know, with your integrity intact, um, trying to uphold the law under a gangster regime? Yes, and certainly by the end of the dead of night, um, there are a few situations, they're very tricky situations that he's going to have to somehow resolve and 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 stay alive and keep his job. So um, yeah. I hope I hope book three is in the works is all I can say, because I've so enjoyed the other two. <laughs> Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I've got uh, plots for book three and four sorted out um, and I'm doing the research for those. So that, that will be written uh, later in the year and come out, I imagine, early next year. The first of those. Um, so early yeah, twenty twenty four. Yeah, for book three. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. So um, right. and then one year um, as we go through, and ideally, you know, we we, we follow him through, and, he, and if he's lucky, he'll survive the war, and then the, the, the last one or two maybe will be after the war because I think that's going to be a really fascinating situation where Berlin is in ruins and all the, all the social infrastructure and everything's crumbled and there are still crimes and still a, a need for people to uphold the law. You know, so I think that's going to be an interesting period. Yes, it's, um, I think it is. And you've got quite a long time period to cover there, haven't you? Because the first two books just take you up to winter of 1940, in, in early 1940, I mean. Yeah. Yeah, I've got to be careful there, actually, because um, I, when I started writing the Roman series, I assumed it was going to be about 12 books long, and I, and I would get to the, the big crunch point at 69 AD, you know, by the end of uh, 12 books. I'm still ten years short of that, and I've written 22 books. You know, so <laughs> if I'm not careful, the same thing will happen with Schenker. So I need to kind of move the time, uh, timeline along a bit, I think, for book three. Bit yes. of sunshine. <laughs> yes. Oh, I, I look forward to that. The cold has been getting me down a bit, but it's very atmospheric. Um, mm. A bit of a whimsical question now, Simon, which I hope you'll indulge. Um, if you could go back in time to any period in history, which would it be and why? 
Oh, goodness gracious. Um, well, it wouldn't be Nazi Germany. I thought not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wouldn't mind actually being around. Uh, I mean, it, it would be very, very risky at the point at which um, the, the Roman Republic collapsed just to sort of see. Because one of my favorite television series of all time is something called Rome, which is, um, HBO did a few years ago, quite a few years ago now. Um, and they and they played it really really well. So um, they they sort of looked at a whole cross section of Roman society, and the, one of the episodes is called "How Titus Pullo Brought Down the Roman Republic," and it basically comes to a, he had had a bad night out, a drinking night out, got into a fight, and then sees this guy in the forum one day and um, goes for him, and that's what causes the Roman Republic to collapse. And um, and I'm thinking. You know, I really, really like that approach because it's that whole horseshoe nail syndrome. And, you know, everybody kind of writes these broad, it's, you know, uh, spreads of history and big characters and big themes and so on. And so on, so often history is entirely contingent on tiny little factors that, you know, go a different way. So, for example, um, the Battle of Gettysburg might have gone a completely different way if some Confederate office staff officer hadn't managed to lose the crucial you know, Confederate battle plans, which he'd used to wrap his cigars in. So, and that fell into yeah. the, you know, the Union Army's hands. So these, these small things have huge consequences. So, you know, in answer to the old question, if you could go back in time and shoot Hitler. Oh, every time. I like that. Even, I like that. Yes. You sound very even as a child. That's one child I would happily smother, you know, given what happened. But, um, yeah. Um, so what, which authors would you say have influenced you as a writer? Um, well, I think uh, my interest in historical fiction and history more broadly uh, began when my dad gave me a copy of, um, what was it called? The Happy Return, the first of the Hornblower novels that was written. And, um, you know, I just read it and I thought, wow, you know, I'm totally into this um, world 200 years ago on the deck of this ship and these amazing characters. And it really blew my mind. And, and, and I never looked back, really, after that moment. I mean, I'd probably recommend it. If, nobody's, if, if you haven't read uh, CS4, you know, that, that series, the Hornblower series, I think it's one of the best series in historical fiction ever, still. So it was... It was reading historical fiction, um, the C.S. Forrester, that kind of set you on this path, do you think? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Um, because I, the first three books I wrote after I graduated um, were books that I thought would be very, very commercial. So, you know, I'd done the research, seen what was selling, and, and so I wrote a, uh, a sort of post-apocalyptic novel. I wrote a comedy about some students who get into the drugs business and go get foul of some professional gangs. And then I wrote a crime novel. And, you know, some of these things were getting sort of reasonable feedback from agents. And then I thought, well, you know, whilst I was waiting, well, what do I actually want to read? And um, at the time, I discovered Lindsay Davis, and she writes this kind of Raymond Chandler version of Ancient Rome. Absolutely fabulous books. And I liked what she did there. So this worm's eye view of the Roman Empire. And then I thought, yeah, but I want to be reading about sort of, you know, Roman soldiers. And nobody at the time was writing anything like that. So I thought, well, I'll do it for me. And uh, when I submitted that to an agent, and they said, yeah, great. You know, actually, what I did was I submitted the first three chapters. And they said, great, can we have the rest of the book? And I said, well, I'd like to help you out there. But the rest of the book is still in the pen. Yeah. Um, so uh, I had to sort of like get that written pretty quickly and then edited with the help of the agent. And uh, pretty quickly, we, we got a deal. So um, the rest, as they say, is historical fiction. Yes. Yes, indeed. And uh, is that is that a tip you would give to any aspiring writer to, to write the kind of book that you, you want to read but isn't out there? Absolutely. Um, you know, I, even if you want, you know, if, you, if there are plenty of books in a, in a sort of area that you're interested in writing about, that's no reason not to add yours to the mix. But the, the key thing is you've got to want, you know, you've got to want to tell the story and you've, you know, you have to enjoy doing it and it has to be the story that you would enjoy um and if it has that kind of integrity about it i think uh, it transmits itself to the reader 
Um, and they get, and they, you know, they, they'll spot that and they'll think, yeah, this person's not faking it. They actually care about what they're writing. Um, and so I'll give it a go. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that's one of the things that I've really enjoyed about the books of yours I've read thus far is um, I do get that sense that you're, you're enjoying it. You're enjoying the process. Well, it's a two, it's a two handled thing. This, I think one of the things that tends to get overlooked is that you know writing may well be a skill, but so is reading, and there are you know good and bad readers, just as there are good and bad writers. And what you hope is that your book is going to get into the hands of a good reader. And what I mean by a good reader is, you know, and let's face it, you know, what I do at the end of the day is I take this little cinema playing out of my head, and I make black marks on white paper. That's all it is, you know. And then what the reader does, of course, is they take that into their head and they do the other half of the work, and. You know, you can see when um, a reader is a good reader because they, you know, they are so excited um, and so sort of convinced by what they've read. And, you know, that isn't necessarily a tribute of, of the author. That's a tribute of their skill as a reader in constructing that world from these, you know, as I say, very simple black marks on a white sheet of paper. So it's, you know, I do 50 percent of the work. The reader does the rest, I think. Well, you clearly have, have lots of good readers out there. Um, <laughs> uh, you, you really are a prolific author, Simon. We were talking about this a little bit before uh, we, we went on air. Um, can I ask, are you very disciplined and do you have a kind of set routine for writing that you follow? I, I wish I did. Um, I took <laughs> the, the only kind of set routine, basically, is I'm, I'm doing the research and then I will get a phone call from my editor about three months before the deadline. And she'll say, Simon, how is that book that you're writing coming on? And then that becomes that comes the point at which I have to stop the research and get on with the writing. Uh -huh. um, so I'm afraid I'm one of these people that, uh, you know, I'm a bit like one of those bad students. I'm always pushing the deadlines um, because I'm, I'm not very organized. I don't have a daily routine. Um, I, I, I get up and, you know, uh, you know when, I'm down, when I'm down to the last th three months and I have to write, and it's all hands to the pump, but, um, and I'll write long hours. You know, there's one time I, I sat down to one of the books about Wellington Napoleon, um, and I sat down nine o'clock in the morning and finished three the next morning, and I'd done about 9,000 words. Oh so you gosh. can get into the zone. And I think there's some really good advice, actually, that Stephen King gives, um, because one of the the awful things about being a writer is that absolute terror of the blank page in the morning because you're looking at it thinking you know I've got to do this I've got to do this and, and nothing's happening and he says that you've got to force yourself to write you've got to sit down and write for 20 minutes set yourself that kind of target and he said it doesn't matter if the first 15 minutes produces absolute shit you know if you keep plugging away there will come a point, and you know, the phrase he uses, I think, is absolute genius. He says there will come a point where you begin to see through the paper. And mm -hmm. of course, what he means by that is that moment where you're so you know into the story that you're beginning to hear stuff, smell stuff, see stuff, and feel it. And it feels kind of very vicarious to you. And when you hit that moment, you can carry on writing for hours and you get lost in it. And you know, you're you know, taken along with the story. And I think that's wonderful when that happens. Yes, it's. I think um, his book on writing, isn't it? And he, he yeah. talks about falling through the hole in the page, and yeah, yeah. that's when you reach that state. Um, great. Well, I think it's time now to switch across to some questions from the audience. Um, so I've got a couple here. So, firstly. Um, you mentioned earlier that you have the next two books in the series plotted. How many mm -hmm. books do you anticipate in the series? And have you written the last book in the series, like Agatha Christie and Curtin? I think you may have partly already answered this, but um, perhaps you could elaborate a little. Well, I, you know, I, 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 I'm not a great planner. Um, I would hope that um, we'd perhaps get a dozen, you know, like the Roman books out of this, which probably means it'll translate into more. Um, and I don't, you know, I haven't got an idea about how it ends. I, I, I did rashly once suggest how the Roman series might end, that they would be on opposite sides in the Civil War in 69 AD. And one of them has to sort of be responsible for the other's execution or something. 
And then there was, I was howled down at this literary festival where I mentioned this. And they said, you know, oh, you can't do that. You know, how could you do that to Macro and Cato? And they were really sort of cross and angry about it. And one 15-year-old actually made the point, I know why you authors do that. It's because you realize that we readers like the characters more than we like you. And I thought, yep, fair enough. You've got me bang to rights there. <laughs> um, so what I say, you know, these days is uh, Macro and Cato, okay, they probably, if they survive, they'll settle down and open some sort of wine importation business in a quiet tea- seaside town called Pompeii. And we'll see how, where that goes. <laughs> I'm sure your readers would love to see that. Um, was Playing With Death your original idea for a thriller series? I noticed that you mentioned in the author note to be planning on writing more parts in that world. Yeah, that's a tricky one. Um, it was a, a book that was uh, missold and mismarketed, really, and, and kind of missed its audience, um, which is, is quite sad because uh, Lee, one of my former students and I, when we sat down to write it, we'd actually planned it as a television series. And we had all that sort of going. We had a producer who was trying to put together a package and that sort of folded. And then we were waiting for the next one to come along. And I said to Lily, you know, why, why, why not? Why don't we just write this as a novel? You know, and if it works, write it as a series. And then if somebody wants to buy the film rights off us, then we'll get paid again. And then if we're writing the screenplay for it, which we have, we've already got one of those ready, we'll get paid again. So we can be paid three times for the same story effectively. So that's why we, we, we sat down and wrote the novel. And I'm really pleased with it. And, and one of the nicest feedback uh, comments we had was from the FBI guy who gave us a bit of information on this. And he said it's the most accurate novel or accurate representation of the FBI that he's seen. And I thought, thank you. Mm. you know, it's always nice when you get that sort of right uh, oh, gosh, from somebody yeah. who knows. Yeah. And it but, comes uh, back to the research again, doesn't it? Yep, absolutely. And we did a lot of research for that. And the funny thing is, you know, we were kind of setting this thing in the near future. And almost as we were writing it, the things that we were predicting were happening. So um, I'm, it's one of the books I'm really, really proud of, actually, because we got so much right um, about what was going to happen with this technology. Oh, I'm going to have to check that one out now. <laughs> well, it's, it's a bit scary um, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, and it, you know, it's interesting because when I wrote it, I thought I, I didn't want to send it to my um, original um, editor. So I, I had my agent send it to somebody else instead because I just, I, you know, you always worry that your editor might be telling you what they think you want to hear. So that's why I thought we'd try somebody else. And this other director said it was the most, uh, editor said it was the most uh, frightening book he'd read. And I thought, oh, okay. Gosh. Yeah. Oh, well, I like to be a bit scared. So I think... Bring it on, I say. Um, oh, another question arising from that. Um, mm-hmm. Will new books in that world, the playing with death world, ever come out? Or is your writing of thrillers now focused on Schenker in Nazi Germany? If well, so, um, why do you prefer, sorry, if so, why no. do you prefer that scene over the scene in playing with death? Um it's a difficult one, this, because, um, you know, you live or die by your um, book scan ratings in, as a writer. And, for, you know, for whatever the reasons, and, you know, I mentioned what some of what they might be, you know, it wasn't the big success that we were hoping for. Um, and the problem then becomes, if you, if you try and uh, get a sequel out, they will look to the first book and they will say, ah, you know, you didn't sell. It doesn't matter what the quality of the book is, they will look at the figures, you know, the sales mm-hmm. figures. So um, you could write, you know, the best book ever, and if it only sold five copies, and then you write the best sequel ever, you know, this, this, that will never see the day, of, you know, the, the light of day. And that's, that's unfortunate just how the business works. Mm. Uh, another question. Um, do you have other historical periods you would like to write about? Uh, yes. Um, I mean, you know, my, my interest is in the broad expanse of history. Um, you know, I'm always reading, dipping in here, dipping in there. Um, I'm, at the moment, I'm, you know, my toilet reading is a history of Byzantium. So you know, <laughs> you know, why, why waste the moment? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's funny, isn't it? When you do go, you know how you go to people's houses and you look at their bookcases and so on? You know, I, I always think the measure of a good household is whether they have a good selection of books in the toilets as well. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, I'm concerned now. I'm, I'm significantly no. lacking in that area. <laughs> Get yourself some shell stuff. Go on. Yes. <laughs> um, what else have we got? How does being an author compare to being a teacher? Ooh. Well, there is a significant overlap, as you'd expect, uh, because, you know, there are lessons to be taught in, in fiction, um, without a shadow of a doubt. And... Um, but, you know, the truth of it is, it is that I miss teaching a lot. Um, it's, students I used to teach were just wonderful. And, and uh, you know, a lot of them have stayed in touch and they've gone on to enjoy successful careers. And, um, you know, I'm delighted by that. And it's just so rewarding to sit, sit down with young people and open doors for them. I'm, you know, it, teachers shouldn't claim all the credit. What she, teachers do is they open the doors. You know, it's up to the student mm -hmm. whether they step through or not. But if you can do it in a sufficiently interesting way, and like, ta-da, you know, then, of course, they will step in and find stuff out, and it, and it works out really well. And I miss it because um, there's nothing quite as exciting as a lesson that goes off in a completely different tangent to the way you intended. And most of, the, of, of learning, I think, is in, is in the discursion away from you know, the, 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 whatever it is you found, it's there in the corners. You know, one of them would ask a question that I didn't know the answer to, and I'd say, rather than say, bluff my way out of it, or say, I don't know, I would, I would say, okay, well, that's a really good question. What do we think? Let's start thinking about how we're going to answer this one, because I don't know. And I think that being honest with them and, you know, saying, okay, let, let's speculate, you know, and it, and it was really creative. And I used to say to, um, I remind my students, I said, look, you know, when you get your degree, let's um, not assume that this is a qualification of knowledge. You know, a degree is at best a license to doubt. And what it should do is train you to ask questions. No more than that. You know, you're not going to be an expert in anything because there are people with PhDs who will know far more than you do. Um, but if you're smart, you'll treat it as a, as a device that you can apply to things that are presented to you and sort of say, and you can say, well, okay, I won't take this on face value. What about this? What about that? What about this? And I think that's a far more valuable uh, qualification in, in, you know, viewed in those terms than as some sort of definite knowledge about something. And, um, you know, and we used to get fantastic results from those students because, you know, that's how we pitched it. And they really responded. And one of the great tragedies, I think, of, of teaching is, um, the way that successive governments have tried to stop it being education and turn it into training instead. You know, education is about being flexible. Education is about giving people the tools so that they can cope with different situations. It's not telling them how to sort of, you know, undo a nut. Um, and, and I think that that is largely the problem. So when you know, people like Rishi Sunak go on about, well, maths is important, you know, um, sciences are important, English is a waste of time, history is useless, Arts, no, you know, no use at all. You're thinking you have no idea what's going to be useful in the future. You know, you have no idea what things like, you know, the arts contribute to our economy, if nothing else. And you know, to modes of expression, to exploring things. You know, it's no, it's no. For example, I don't think it's a coincidence that cubism and the general theory of relativity came out in exactly the same year. You know, and the, the one is the sort of the, the, the other side of the coin of the other there, you know, in terms of the sort of perception of reality. So I think, that, you know, these things are actually, you know, complementary. They're not something you can dispense with. So did I, did I read somewhere that you would like to go back into teaching? Well, that's my plan here, you know, where I am at the moment. Mm. I'm trying to set up a creative writing course at the local university. Um, the difference being is, you know, well, the situation here is that there are no creative writing courses in any of the universities. So what I'm trying to pitch it as is creative writing as a commercial activity. Because one of the things I noticed about creative writing programs in, in the UK is they treat the sort of commercial part of it as if it's some sort of dirty secret. And if you actually stop and ask people and say, okay, so what do you hope for out of your creative writing MA course? They want to become professional writers. They want to be paid for it. They want to make a living out of it. So, you know, it seems that we're, you know, starting from the wrong point, you know, place. If that's what their goal is, then they need to think about, you know, monetizing their idea right from the outset. You know, if this is what I want to write, is it a commercial possible, you know, is it commercially viable? And if it is, how do I then make it as 
you know, as, as maximally commercially viable as possible. And so what I'm hoping to set up is, is this creative writing course where we, we start, you know, from that point of view, and then when we start the actual creative writing, it is in the context of trying to make this commercially viable. So, you know, we can do all the creative writing stuff that they do in the, in, in the UK, but within that context. That's a very pragmatic approach, and it sounds very sensible one to me. Um, are, you, are you okay for another couple of questions, Simon? Of We've got yeah, yeah. a couple more come through. Um, so somebody said, um, oh, I really liked the Warrior series. I noticed that you teased a follow-up at the end of the book. I just wanted to let you know I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I'm hoping for a follow-up. Well, the, the, the good news is it's a trilogy. Um, so we will uh, be following Karatakis's adventures um, you know, up, up during the Roman invasion and you know, his long campaign to kind of try and frustrate the Romans. So those will be the next two books in the series that Tim and I will be co-writing. Oh, there you go. The person who asked that question, hopefully you'll be pleased to hear that. Um, oh, well, it's another question. It's also, question. On, it's Sorry, also interesting. No. This, 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 Thing that Tim and I are writing about Karatakis is also interesting from another point of view, which is um, it is the story told by a Roman historian who's interviewing Karatakis. And of course, both of them have their own uh, agenda on this. So Karatakis is trying to get his story across and the Roman historians trying to tell it in a way that's going to be acceptable to a Roman audience. So apart from all the, you know, the adventure stuff that happens, you've got this constant pressure on the story from these two sides. Um, and it's how history gets made, of course, because, you know, what we're trying to sort of point out is that, you know, history isn't written by the victors, it's kind of negotiated by the victors. Um, and, uh, it, you know, there's no guarantee how a story will be written, and no guarantee how accurate it will be either. <laughs> oh, and someone's asking about killing characters, and has yeah. observed that a lot of characters died in the last Eagles of the Empire book. Uh -huh. And do you mainly do that to simplify the story, or do you do that to give the characters, the main characters, a reason for revenge and set a serious scene, or maybe a bit of both? Well, you know, the, what it, what the, the last Roman book is, is a, um, about the Budokan revolt, and so will the next one be. So it's, it's sort of Budokan revolt part two. And yes, there is an element of sort of setting the main characters up uh, with a reason to want revenge and a reason to sort of fight and see that, it's, uh, that order is restored. But equally, you know, the Budokan revolt was you know, possibly one of the most cataclysmic events to occur in, in Britain during its history. And when you read the sort of the Roman sources on it, and they talk about um, London being completely burned to the ground and its citizens butchered, and the, you know, the, the sheer savagery uh, that went on there, and you'd be thinking, well, you know, th this is a sort of uh, do or die situation for the Roman garrison and also for the Boudicca and her, and her rebels. So, you know, it's, it's pretty desperate stuff. And, and I think, you know, you can't have a, a, a cast of characters where nobody gets a scratch on them. You know, that, that just doesn't happen. And I think it, I just wanted to sort of get a, give the reader a sense of what's at stake by saying, yeah, these characters who I've created and, you know, lavished a great deal of affection and time on, um, you know, I grieve for them you know, now that they're dead. And, I, you know, if I grieve for them, going back to Henry James, mm -hmm. I would hope that the readers do as well. Mm -hmm. And somebody's also commented, I really like Apollonius and hope to see more of him in the four emperor year. I think he will give a lot of depth to the story. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, Apollonius, the second coming. Um, yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not entirely convinced by that. I think Apollonius may well. I mean, there's possibility he's still alive, but I have my doubts. Oh, okay, interesting. I have to say, in um, Dead of Night, one of my favourite characters is Liebwitz. and um, you do write very engaging characters, Simon. I feel I'm. Thank you you know, I'm invested definitely. Um, Right, I think that's about it for the questions. Um, 
So I'd just like to say thank you again, Simon. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you. And I hope our listeners have enjoyed it as much as I have. I'm sure they have. Um, and I really am looking forward to reading the next instalment of the series when it comes out. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And thank you very much for some really interesting questions. Well, thank you, Laura. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Oh, you too. Take care. Okay. Bye. Bye.